Cities like Siem Reap, there are seven uh, places to buy sex that have two to six hundred girls in each place. These pedophiles will pay four hundred dollars to spend an hour with a child. Organized crime is really behind the growth of the child sex uh, industry in Cambodia. a girl who went for, for years in a brothel, had thought nothing could ever happen good to her, and she became one in which the people of Swaipak, a girl that they have pride in, and one of hers because of, again, what God was able to do in her life. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Stacia Freeman. Did you know that in the nation of Cambodia, the crime of sex trafficking has gotten so entrenched so organized and so brazen that many facilities hold as many as 600 girls each, girls who are being forced to work as sex slaves. Today's guest, Don Brewster, is working in a small village in Cambodia where dozens of young preteen girls are brutalized by pedophiles every single day. He's there to help provide a care facility for the girls once they've been rescued by another ministry that specializes in that part of the equation. Come with us and see the heart of God. Originally in Sacramento, we worked with at-risk kids. And I was on staff at a church as a pastor. And we were, and I was over missions and compassion. And we went to visit missionaries in Cambodia that we supported. Uh, while we were there, I did leadership training and was in 13 provinces in 10 days. Talked to hundreds of people, actually thousands, literally thousands, and asked about the problems in Cambodia. And never once did human or child sex trafficking come up, not one time. And then when we got back, the day after we got back uh, into the States, there was an NBC News program, Children for Sale. And it was all about the sex, child sex trade in Cambodia. And it really just struck us that kids we were playing with, kids we were holding, there were a certain percentage of them that were being trafficked and we didn't even know it. And uh, we have three daughters and six granddaughters and we just felt like if no one would help our daughters or granddaughters, um, how would we feel? And we just felt like we needed to do something. And we went back and we spent three weeks in Cambodia researching and we met with NGOs and with the Cambodian government to determine what was the greatest need at that time. And we spoke with International Justice Mission, and they had been doing rescues of girls in Cambodia, but they had stopped because there was no place to take the rescued girls. And so we knew definitely that was God's call for us. It was to open an aftercare center. We worked really hard to develop that plan, put together everything we could based on our research, and began to pray for who God was to send because we were positive it, it wasn't us. But uh, God had a surprise for us, it was us. In cities like Siem Reap, there are seven uh, places to buy sex that have two to 600 girls in each place. And we would estimate uh, that 20 to 30% of those are underage. And then the second thing that has happened is Cambodia has become the hotspot for prepubescent girls. In the village we live in, Swaipak, literally every day, foreign pedophiles come to this little dirty village in Cambodia to purchase little girls. And it's not the nickel and dime trade that you see uh, on some of the old footage about the human or child sex trafficking. These pedophiles will pay $400 to spend an hour with a child. And, and this happens every single day to dozen upon dozens of girls in this little village of Swipak. Organized crime is really behind the growth of the child sex uh, industry in Cambodia. And the problem is corruption and very powerful and highly influential people behind this. Uh, and in a country where um, poverty is rampant, uh, the estimates are between a half a billion and a billion dollars of revenue come into the country through child sex trafficking.
the level of uh, emotional, spiritual trauma that these girls endure is really beyond our imagination. I mean, th these girls are not just being raped. They're being raped, and again, re remember, these girls that we work with range in age from three is the youngest we've ever had up to age 22, but most of them between eight and 12 years old. They are raped five to 10 times every day 365 days a year. And it's not just rape, they're tortured. There are things that we can't even imagine that happen to these kids. And this level of trauma is, is increased because of the Cambodian culture and what it says about girls who have been abused like this. They're trash. Uh, there is a, um, there's a proverb in Cambodia that says, boys are gold and girls are cloth. And what it means is a boy, no matter how they suffer, what happens to them, they're like gold, they don't lose their value. Girls are like a cloth, and once they're soiled, they're no good, and they're just to be thrown away. And so on top of that trauma is just the stigma that the culture puts on these kids. And it's, again, it's beyond our imagination. And, it, and it, the truth is, if a girl isn't rescued, that by the time they reach their late teens, uh, the likelihood of them being dead is high from HIV, AIDS, overdose of drugs, even suicide as they are trapped in this environment. Girls who are rescued and girls who are, get to come to a quality aftercare center, their lives can be transformed. I mean, we're blessed that we have cutting edge programs. We have um, Oh, the therapy we use is called TFCBT, which is, is considered the best in the world for, for bringing healing to a traumatized girl, especially one commercially sexually exploited children. But the real key is not the quality of those programs. In therapy or through a program, through Bible study, the girls are told they have value, that, that they're loved by God. And they get it in their head. They understand that. What happens when the transformation and healing really takes place is when they experience God's love. And it's through the Cambodian staff that God has brought to us, Cambodian Christians, who unconditionally love these kids. And when they experience that love flowing through them, uh, through the Cambodian staff to these kids' hearts, that's when the transformation really takes place. And of course, in a center, we, we, we need that spiritual and emotional healing to take place. But beyond that, there is continuing on in the world what will happen to them. And for that reason, we provide academic education, uh, life skills uh, education, because most of these girls have not been part of a family where they learn basic life skills. Uh, we also do vocational type training. And through, through the educational process, uh, we prepare these girls to be reintegrated as healthy, uh, active young adults. And in amazing, I mean, there are amazing stories of transformation. There's one uh, young lady named Chang, Chang, who's allowed us to share her story. When she was nine years old, she was trafficked by her mom. From the age of nine to 12, her mom had kept her locked in really a prison-like cell. And the only people she saw were the men who were coming to abuse her on a daily basis. When she was finally rescued after three years, I mean, the trauma, again, we can't imagine that she experienced, her mother was arrested and sent to prison. Now, her mother is in prison, and in Cambodia, you can take your child to prison with you. And Chang had a little brother that her mother took to prison. In the prison, you say, well, why would that happen? Well, that happens because in Cambodia, there's, the prisoners do not get enough food and water. So Western organizations give money to the prisoners so they can buy that. If you have your child with you, you get more money. So this mother continued to exploit her child, keeping him in a prison, a co-ed prison with rapists and murderers. Now we would take Chang every month to visit her brother and mother in prison. And every month she would beg her mom, please let, let my brother go, please let him come back with me. And month after month, her mother would say no. Yet this girl, somehow, through really God's mercy and grace and the love of this, our Cambodian staff, came to accept Christ as her savior. Upon accepting Christ as her savior, her, she became determined to be able to read and write. And she studied hard, and her first goal was to be able to read God's word. 
once she, had, once she had been able to do that, her first goal was to memorize scripture, and her first was 1 Corinthians 13, the entire chapter. And she took two weeks. She got it word for word perfect. She shared it in front of uh, 60 girls and uh, 60 staff people. And the cool thing was, it was we, what we had talked about before, it wasn't just in her head, it was in her heart. She really believed it. She went on to the best vocational school in uh, Cambodia, where she became a barista and a baker of cakes. And not just any cakes. Uh, the cakes she has made, she makes cakes that have sold to the king of Cambodia, who has sold to the prime minister of Cambodia. Now consider where she started off locked in this cell and all the abuse she went through. And she gets to this point in her life, and that's pretty cool all by itself. But that didn't end there with her. The next step was she wanted to help the poor kids in her community where she lived after she was reintegrated. Every day this kid comes home from work, buys books and pencils and papers, and teaches the poor kids in her neighborhood to do what she says so they will have a good life like me. That's a miracle. That's truly a miracle. And we are blessed to get to experience that over and over again. Daniel Walker spent years infiltrating the multi-billion dollar global sex industry and has written an eyewitness account of what is really going on inside the brothels and bars of today's world. It's called God in a Brothel, an undercover journey into sex trafficking and rescue. It's an account of years of undercover investigation where hundreds of children and teens were set free from sex slavery and dozens of perpetrators were prosecuted for their horrendous crimes against humanity. To get God in a Brothel, just go to www.purepassion.us. Thinking of having a night out on the town with your buddies? Maybe picking up a working girl and going crazy? Let everyone know you're the man, right? Maybe even go younger tonight. She needs the money. Get the babe you never had when you were a kid. Don't ask, don't tell, right? Or maybe you'd like to take less risk and just score some underage porn to get you through the night. Thing is, that C note that you just laid down for the girl, it's going to pay for the kidnapping and gang rape of the next one. Because the girl you have tonight will be dead or destroyed before the year's out. Stop the insanity. We can help. When a child first comes to uh, our aftercare center, they think they are trash. That's what the culture tells them. That's what they believe and what happened to them. That, of course, the feelings that go with the thought that I'm trash is that uh, uh, I'm hopeless because what, 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 can, uh, uh, what can I do? You know, this, this happened to me. I can't change that. And the result is, well, I no use trying in school or no use changing the way I am or correcting behavior problems that you might have. But when they begin to believe, when they begin to believe that Jesus loves them, Jesus died for them, and that he has a plan for their life, you see the transformation from hopelessness to hopefulness. And it results in, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to do all that I can do to be what God has called me to become. And that change from hopelessness to hopefulness is amazing to see. There was a, a girl named Mian, and she was, she was part of IJM's first rescue attempt in Swipak. And, and she, they burst into the place, and of course many of the girls scatter, they can't get them all, and she was one of those that ran away. She had been taught that the police are no good, and that the NGOs are no good, so she didn't want anything to do with them. And the pimp who ran that brothel was just able to send her off to other brothels. And she ended up in Siem Reap. And eight years later, she was part of another rescue attempt. And this time, they got her and they just offered her the opportunity to come and be in our center. And, and she said yes, which is, the odds aren't really high that the girl will say that at that age, which she's been through. But she said yes. And what ended up happening was really, again, it's, it's just a miracle of God because she came in 22 years old, cannot read or write, never been to school a day in her life. Very excited about school the first day. But then she found out school isn't so much fun if you've never been before and you're 22 years old. And it was hard work. But, you know, she persevered through it. She became functionally illiterate. And she had this dream. And the dream was that she would have, and her words were, were so cute, she said, I want to have a tailor shop. Not a big one, but just a little one by my mom's house so I can help her. 
And uh, she, she, when she got done with her academic education, she went to tailoring school and she became a whiz. I'm an absolute whiz. As a matter of fact, uh, if I'm in Cambodia, I'm always wearing Hawaiian shirts that Mian has made for me. They're my prized possession. But so, so she, she went from, she went back to this community, Swaipak, where she was trafficked from. And instead of being considered the piece of trash, because she could read and write now, which most of the boys in town could not read and write, and now because she had a business of her own that we were able to help give a micro loan for her to get started, and she was becoming very successful. She was earning money to support her own family. And the next thing that happened, again, we, we didn't know if this could ever happen, but she fell in love with a boy who loved her despite knowing about her past. And, and uh, just two months ago, they were married. And, they, and, and he is a great young man who takes care of her. They have a little house that they've been able to purchase based on his work as a fisherman and hers is running this tailor shop. And again, this was a girl who went for, for years in a brothel, had thought nothing could ever happen good to her, and she became one in which the people of Swaipak, a girl that they have pride in, and one of hers because of, again, what God was able to do in her life. And the day she was reintegrated, uh, I love she, we have a little party for them, and her words, her words to everybody is, I thank God for the new life he's given me. Now we have hope. We don't find girls having a, a grudge against God normally. Uh, and the reason is there's really no basis for them to even know who God is. What the Khmer Rouge did to that country in, in executing all the um, educated and all the religious uh, really takes God out of the equation for them. Um, also, I, I do think that in this country, and we're just beginning to get involved with this now, there is a lack of places for these girls to go. And by places, I mean um, in the U.S., if a girl is rescued, there, most places there's not a place to send her to. And, and she might go to Juvie Hall, actually, or she may end up going to a foster family. Um, and the foster families are a bad choice right now because in the state of California, over 80% of the girls, uh, minor girls, who have been rescued from sex trafficking came from foster families. And, and the, the ingredient that's missing here really is Christian families being willing to take these kids in. And I think there's two reasons for it. I think, first of all, I don't think it's ideal that a girl come right from the streets into a Christian family. Um, but if there isn't a, like an assessment center type deal, a place where she can go and spend two or three months, become stabilized, and then, then take that next step and to go into a Christian family who has been challenged by the church, that this is really a command of God's for us to care for orphans, that they have been equipped, because this is a different story. I mean, I, I don't take this lightly. We've, we live with 50 trafficked girls, and it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but if you're equipped and supported on an ongoing basis, the love that these girls will receive from a Christian family will make the difference, can change that. That, that God is the problem. As an example, in residential care, and again, we do residential care in Cambodia. In residential care, you say, well, the staff is the girl's family that pours out unconditional love. And that's true. But the staff works eight-hour shifts, so you have three different, either rotating. They work five-hour days. Who is the family that a girl is with 24-7? It's so other traumatized girls. And they're not ideally set to bring that love to a kid, that unconditional love. And as a matter of fact, much of the failure that takes place in programs is because a girl feels more wanted by a pimp that has abused her and sold her than, than in the residential care or the foster family who takes her in. Uh, and we really believe that this is a key in the, long, in, in the long and short run in this country. If Christian families can again be challenged to, equipped to, and supported to care for these girls, that grudge against God 
I believe that grudge against God can be overcome again because you experience the truth. You just don't hear the truth. You experience it in a meaningful way, and it's the combination of the two that really will make a difference in a kid's life. Want more? We have free videos and other resources online, as well as free iPhone and Droid apps that stream every program that we've ever produced. Our primary ministry website is masteringlife.org. The website for this TV program is purepassion.us, but you can also find us on YouTube, GodTube, Vimeo, XP Media, and Cross TV. Over 130 videos, all free. So get more. Daniel Walker spent years infiltrating the multi-billion dollar global sex industry and has written an eyewitness account of what is really going on inside the brothels and bars of today's world. It's called God in a Brothel, an undercover journey into sex trafficking and rescue. It's an account of years of undercover investigation where hundreds of children and teens were set free from sex slavery and dozens of perpetrators were prosecuted for their horrendous crimes against humanity. To get God in a Brothel, just go to www.purepassion.us. There's so many people that have no idea what's going on. They don't understand about the torture, the severe abuse that these girls go through. And when they do, what happens are people saying, I've got to do something about this. In response to this evil, we do four things. We prevent we rescue, we restore, and we equip. We're seeking out the toughest communities where children are being abused. We're moving in and transforming these places from the inside out. Through working in these communities, partnering with churches, and building relationships, we're receiving leads about children and slavery, and we're acting on these leads to rescue these children. At Agape Restoration Center, we have 57 girls, and the average age is between 8 to 13. And really the key is this, for them to be able to accept love in a healthy way, and to be able to give love in a healthy way. We have over 700 churches throughout the country of Cambodia, and they are being trained and developed to respond to the specific needs as they come up. We're going to sacrifice to it hurts because this is an evil that needs to be destroyed and that's what we're committed to do. The church needs to help build awareness. I mean, it's great that it is now becoming more, human trafficking is becoming more of a hot button issue. But, but uh, sometimes I think we try to be too polite about it in, in the way we express what happens to girls, the way we're so cautious of it. And I think it, it dulls our senses a little bit. And I think the church needs to be brought aware and, and be challenged to share this information. And then the church needs to, to respond, I believe, in, in three ways. Uh, the church needs to, of course, pray because nothing will happen without prayer. The church needs to give to support ministries, and of course, I'd be hopefully one of the ministries to get supported, so uh, I'm certainly not unbiased in that opinion. Uh, but the third, again, Christian, Christians need to become the family of these kids because God's restorative love will flow through those families in a truly remarkable way. Residential care like we do in Cambodia, caring for a girl is a very expensive thing. And it doesn't, it, and you may think, well, in Cambodia, it's a third world country, but it actually cost eight to nine hundred dollars a month to, to, to care for one girl. And this provides everything from education to counseling to food and every, every meeting, every single need they have along the way. Um, that sounds expensive until you look at the cost in the U.S., which is ten thousand dollars a month per girl. The idea for thirty dollars a month you can care for a kid. Um, 
that's just not the case with these kids. We spend, on the average girl coming into our aftercare, in the first two months, we spend between $1,500 and $2,000 on health care alone for these kids based on their abuse. And so it's not now the idea that you can kind of like adopt a child and you can bring, bring everything she needs for $30 a month, that's not true. But if there is a bunch of people willing to give $30 a month to make that small sacrifice for most Americans, uh, there, there could be care provided. There wouldn't be waiting lists. Like we have a waiting list to get into our aftercare home. There wouldn't be a waiting list if the funding were available. And the same thing is true on the flip side in prevention. Uh, we work in the prevention end. The work we do in SWIPOC is specifically uh, prevention, and we've had remarkable things. We've had four traffickers in 2010 stop trafficking girls. Now, that's a big miracle for this single reason alone. A trafficker of young girls in SWIPOC, Cambodia, makes four to $7,000 a month. The average wage in Cambodia is about $30 a month. All four of these young men now make $50 a month. And they have got the, the, the one who has been the longest has been over 11 months now on the straight and narrow because it, 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 taking that kind of cut in pay, which can only happen through God working in his heart. And those types of things, those programs that are being done, not just by our ministry, but by ministries around the world, if they are funded and prayed for, is truly God can make a tremendous difference in this area. We're, I really believe that God has uh, called us to this specific uh, need, this human rights issue uh, for the 21st century. This is one of those areas of need where the question of whether to help such victims of brutality is a no-brainer. We here at Pure Passion carefully check out the ministries that we feature on this program to make certain that they are run by people of integrity who sacrificially minister the love of Jesus Christ to people who desperately need Him. Don and Bridget Brewster have given their lives to the cause of Christ, which is to rescue the lost and to share His love for them. Why not help Agape and International Missions in this important work? Just go online to agapewebsite.org. And until next week, I'm Stacia Freeman for Pure Passion. From all the darkness, following you to where the light is. Got the steps I'm taking.